Isn't it a remarkable time that we live in? Absolutely remarkable. And a great topic too, by the way, because almost to the very day, um, 100 years ago, Jerusalem was taken uh, control of by the Britons, or by the British, should I say. And we're going to explore that tonight um, in a little detail. We're going to explore a lot of the events that led up to that occasion and also we'll finish off with what, why that's so significant for us and why it's significant for Bible students around the world. So about 100 years ago, to the very day when that actually occurred. So God gave his people many warnings, many warnings. And this is just one of those warnings, but it kind of sums up, if you like, in a bit of a, a context as to what has happened to the Jewish people over such a period of time. And this one basically says, and I think you can just read that. You can't read the line that was in red, I'm sorry, but I'll read it out for you. And if you will not, for all this, all the kindness that God's done for them, hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I will scatter you among the heathen, he says, and I will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Pretty strong words, isn't it? And I guess if they were said to us, we would do what we could to do the right thing. But of course, people do what they do, and God's people disobeyed him and followed other gods. And as a consequence, we read chapters like we did tonight in Jeremiah, which was to say that God was giving them up to the world. And they were scattered. There are many quotations through Isaiah, through Jeremiah, through Ezekiel, which explain that God's people were given up to the world and scattered as punishment for not hearkening unto him. Let's have a quick background check. Of course, we know that Saul was the first king of Israel and we know that David... Uh, set up Jerusalem particularly as the capital of that kingdom and of course these words which were penned for Zedekiah the last of the kings of Judah um, in that period so after that of course we, we note in Ezekiel that there was no longer going to be a king to reign over Israel no longer until he whose right it was which is, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. And there has not been a king in Israel since that time. A city of peace is what Jerusalem really means, isn't it? A city of peace. Or, if you like, this is the city. If anyone wants to know what peace is all about, this is the city to look at. Well, whilst we know that to be the case in the future, it certainly has been everything but peaceful, hasn't it? If you just look at some of the statistics of this city, it's been attacked 52 times in history, captured and recaptured 44 times and besieged 23 times and destroyed twice. It's amazing that it's even still there, isn't it? But this is Jerusalem. We look at those streets of, the, of Jerusalem and many of you tonight in the audience have been to Jerusalem. I have not. I would love to go there one day. almost had the opportunity this year, but I just couldn't line that up. But so many have inhabited this city over time. Just have a look at all the groups. There's Judaism from the time of, of uh, King David. Then it was, of course, inhabited by the pagans. Roman times. Christianity took over that city. Islam took over that city, the Crusade period, the Mamluk period, the Ottoman period, the Empire period including Napoleon and of course what we now know as Zionism. And that's, that's a lot isn't it? To think of one city in the world to be inhabited by so many different groups of people. What an amazing remarkable city. To what end did God want to scatter them? 
What did God intend to do with his people? Well, of course, we've got this wonderful chapter in Ezekiel 37. Perhaps we'll return there very briefly. We're not going to go through Ezekiel 37 in any great detail tonight. We've got lots to cover. But if we go there just briefly, in Ezekiel 37, we know this is the, the prophecy of the Jewish nation and how that they were considered at this to be a nation that was dead like a valley of dry bones. And of course the prophecy goes on to say that these bones would live. The question is there, can these bones live? Well of course these bones can live. How are they to live? Well, if you look in verse uh, of chapter 37 and verse 3, and he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and so on and so forth, right through until this, this great prophecy talks about them becoming a great army standing on their feet. In verse 7, I prophesied and I saw and commanded and I prophesied and there was a noise and there was a shaking and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon it and the skin covered it, but there was no breath in it. And then, of course, he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, come and the, and the Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, and they may live. And I prophesied, and continues on in verse 10, towards the end there, they stood up on their feet, a great, exceeding great army. And this is the house of Israel, it says in verse 11. This is a prophecy of the house of Israel. What a remarkable prophecy. And we just read in Jeremiah 16 about how that no longer will people say that this is Israel that came up from Egypt, but this is Israel that came from the north and from the south and from the east and from the west because they've been scattered all around the world and they've been brought back. So these are two quite remarkable prophecies which have been fulfilled in our time. How? How were they fulfilled? Well, let's just have a look at some of the events. If you have a look back in Jeremiah 16, it, it tells us there, doesn't it? We read this tonight. In Jeremiah 16, verse 16, it says, Behold, I will send for many fishes. Many fishes. And they, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. Now, when you go fishing, you're luring the fish, aren't you? And that's what these men, and I've put them faces up there. I hope that you can see them. These are some of the men that God chose to use to fish or to create a lure for his people to come back to the land. And it happened over a great period of time, but just like the prophecy in, in Ezekiel 37, there was a process that happened. So we're going to explore just briefly some, all of these characters, just very briefly, and show you how it all fit together before the taking of Jerusalem. Straight after that verse, or straight after that, in that same verse, verse 16, God says, and then I will send hunters. I don't know if you can see that pretty clearly, but I don't know who took the photo. I don't suspect he would have lived for much longer. Looking out, imagine the doors opening up in your barn that you're hiding in to see that crowd looking at you with a vicious dog. I mean... What we know, or they didn't at the time, is horrific, isn't it, to see that scene. There will be many hunters, and we know, we know a lot of the faces of these hunters, don't we? And of course, we know Hitler was the master craftsman of that group. But one that was even more evil than him was the guy directly below, and Heinrich Himmler, the leader or the head of the SS, who orchestrated the extermination of the Jewish people at that time. Many hunters would come as well to drag people back to Jerusalem. 
Now, I just want to draw your attention at this point in time to uh, Dr. John Thomas's words out of Elpis Israel. He wrote Elpis Israel in 1849, which was well before the time period that we're now going to go through. And these are some of the words that he wrote. There is then a partial and a primary restoration of Jews before the manifestation, before the return of Christ, which is to serve as a nucleus or basis of future, and op future operations in the restoration of the rest of the tribes after he has appeared in his kingdom. He goes on to say, the pre-adventual colonialisation of Palestine will be on the purely political principles and the Jewish uh, colonists will return in unbelief of the messiahship of Jesus, which is true, isn't it? Just as it is still today. They will immigrate thither as agriculturalists, that was very true, and traders in the hope of ultimately establishing their commonwealth, but more immediately of getting rich in silver and gold under the efficient protection of the British power. Now this was written back in 1849. And he had this understanding based upon his belief of Bible prophecy. What a remarkable mind to be able to see that amongst the religious world of the day that was blind to that. Once again, God raised him up to help us understand these things. We come to another man, Theodore Herzl. We've heard much about this man. Well, he was also an author of another book, a book which was... Uh, called the uh, Judenstaat, which basically means he wants to bring the Jews back to the land. That was what the book was all about. And he believed that could happen. He was the man that was born to bring this, this to the attention of the, of the political world at that time. The reason he went down this track was because of the anti-Semitism that was occurring in Europe at that time, which was a dreadful thing. On the 3rd of September in 1897, in Brazil, in, Brits, in uh, sorry, Switzerland, we found a very important day in history, and that was the first International Zionist Congress or conference. And Bible students of that time were very excited to see that. Again, Ezekiel 37 coming to light. In that discussion that they had, they had four main. Um, points that came out of that. One was to aspire to establish a homeland for the Jewish people, but it had to be done lawfully and it had to be in the land of Israel. That was what they all agreed upon. They agreed upon the flag, which is the flag they still have today, and they agreed to build a huge amount of wealth or fund, if you like, to buy that land, which of course that wasn't how it was going to end up, but that's what they thought they could do to acquire this country. And, of course, they established the World Zionist Organisation. Quite a remarkable day, and Theodore Herzl was very, very happy with the end result of that and the amount of work that he put in to get to that point. In fact, he was so happy that he wrote these words in his diary on that same day. Were, were I to sum up the Basel Congress in a word which I shall guard against pronouncing publicly, he didn't want to say this publicly, it would be this, at Basel I founded the Jewish state. If I said this out loud today, I would be answered by universal laughter. If not in five years, certainly in 50. Everyone will know it. Do you know what 50 years on from that date was? 1947. 1947, the UN created a resolution which enabled the first state of Israel to be formed in 1948. What a remarkable man God raised up for his nation. Well, here's another man, Dr. Chaim Wiseman. Dr. Chaim Wiseman actually became the first Prime Minister of Israel. But before that, he grew up amongst those in Russia that were being abused um, by the Russians who, who did not like the Jewish people at all, all the anti-Semitism. And he, he was raised up amongst that. And he was a real driving force behind this Zionist movement. In fact, he was a, quite a smart guy. He went over to London to, uh, to study and he became the director of the Admiralty uh, Chemical Laboratories in London. And he also became the president of the Zionist organisation. 
truly a man that God raised up. Now here's something interesting that he did to help the cause for the Jewish people. He got to know people high up in the government. In fact, on the 9th of January in 1906, he met up with Lord Balfour and, and at this time the Britons were trying to find a home for the Jewish people. They felt it was too hard to find a home in Palestine, so they looked further afield and Lord Balfour came to him and said, why don't you look at Uganda in Africa? And this was the conversation as it went from then between uh, Dr Wiseman and Lord Balfour. Dr Wiseman said, Mr Balfour, suppose I was to offer you Paris instead of London, would you take it? The reply was, but Dr Wiseman, we have London. True, but we had Jerusalem, replied Wiseman, who knew that most Anglo-Jewish grandees scorned Zionism when London was a marsh. Are there many Jews who think like you? said Lord Balfour. The response, I speak the mind of millions of Jews. A remarkable man raised for a purpose for the Jewish people. In fact, both of them were raised for a purpose because Lord Balfour then goes on some years later, as we know, to write to Lord Rothschild and the Balfour Declaration which goes on to say, Lord Roth, Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's Government, the following declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspirations which have been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. His Majesty's Government view with views with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use its best endeavours to facilitate the achievements of this objective. Of object. goes on to write, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in, other, in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this to the declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours, Arthur James Balfour. And there became the problem which still remains today between the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people that live in that part of the world. But this clearly was a, was a declaration to want to do something for the Jewish people. His Majesty's government wants you to have a place in Palestine. They're getting somewhere. In fact, it was interesting to note that a lot of the politicians of that day read their Bibles and they had some belief in the Jewish people coming back to their land. Here's, here's a quote from Prime Minister Lloyd George. We had been trained even more in Hebrew history than in the history of our own country. We've got Cabinet Minister uh, Smuts. The day will come when the word of the prophets will become true and Israel will return to its own land. This is from the words of the, those ministers in Cabinet at that time. And the historian David Fromkin actually backs that up and says, Bible prophecy was the first and most enduring of the many motives led by Britons to want to restore the Jews to Zion. So it's pretty remarkable, isn't it, how God works through many different people. But here's the problem. When that declaration was drawn up and sent around, this was what the map looked like. It was 1917 and there had been a world war raging since 1915. But as you can see, that green area is still controlled by the Ottoman Empire. So there's still some work to be done when this was happening. So let's just then find out how that all came about. How did Jerusalem finally get into the hands of the British? Again, through some more remarkable things. We had the war of attrition in Gallipoli, didn't we? That went on from 1915 through to the January 1916 when finally they pulled out. A terrible battle and we as Australians commemorate that each year, don't we? But 
the, the, the war was a, a total failure. And then later on, in, in, to, in 1917, the British decided to change their tactics. And they believed that the only way we should get rid of the Ottoman Empire is not to try and go straight for the heart, but maybe to push them from below. And their tactics changed dramatically. But again, in March 17, they tried to take one of their strongest garrisons of Gaza and failed. The second time they tried, they failed and realised that actually, do you know what, they actually took it. But the communication was so bad, they didn't know they'd taken it, and so they pulled everyone out because they were worried that there was reinforcements coming. It was not long before the British High Command realised that there was some inept people on the ground, that this was not going well. There were some great forces in there, including the Australian force, to help these battles, but they were not being controlled by the right people. And so another man that God has raised up for a purpose was brought along, General Edmund Allenby. He was born in Nottingham in 1861. He saw service in the Boer War in various other conflicts. He was nicknamed the Bull because he was a huge man. Not only was he huge and powerful, but when he got into a bad temper situation, apparently the, 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 his, his, uh, some of his officers suggested it would be better to face the enemy than to face him when he got angry. He was a man who was incredibly disciplined which is partly the reason why he was general in charge of the 3rd Army and Cavalry in the Western Front, which he strongly believed was where the war was going to be won or lost. But he was taken out of that posting and brought down into Egypt. We need someone strong that can deal with this situation. But it wasn't long, even though he thought at first it was a, an absolute joke to be posted down there, it wasn't long before he realised the importance of his, his mission. And he brought about a great change in the direction of that battle down there. This man was very instrumental in doing that. And he had a great, as I said, force behind him, which included a lot of Australians. In fact, there were 40,000 light horsemen. I don't know if you can actually fathom what 40,000 horses might look like. That's a lot of horses to be sitting around the desert. And of course, some of the facts there that you can actually hop online and read about um, are quite remarkable. There's been movies made about the light horsemen. Uh, some 600 plus horses were dying every week, whether it be through fighting or just dying because they're in the desert. It was pretty harsh conditions. Remarkably, there was records of horses going for seven days without water in the desert. I don't know if you can imagine that. Seven days without water. I mean, is God behind this? Of course he is. And of course, the reason that this Light Horse Brigade um, have risen to uh, the status that we, the Australian government hold them at is because they not only did they have a very good campaign in Palestine, but they were the last known cavalry charge in history. And they rode upon these amazing horses that everyone was very impressed by, called whalers. They were called whalers because they originated from the New South Wales. Or they were called whalers, but they were very strong horses. And they changed the direction of the war. So in October 1917, started to get some success. The first success was the Battle of Beersheba. And there's a, a, a picture of the, uh, the light horse in their charge to that place. And apparently, if you read up on it, there's many accounts that even if they wanted to, the soldiers couldn't hold the horses back because they felt that they could smell water. <laughs> but they were just going and they couldn't stop them and they were fearless. And of course in November of 17 they tried for the third time to take Gaza and this time with success with the right general in charge. And there he is, General Allenby. And on, de on December the 11th, I don't know the date today, is the 10th, and there he is walking through the city streets of Jerusalem, walking because he did not want to ride out of respect for that city. And 
the city actually was surrendered on the 9th to, to the British, but he walked through on the 11th. So we're now the 10th, 100 years ago. Bible students were excited by this. Jerusalem, now in the hands of the British. This is the end of the great river Euphrates drying up. Finally, finally it's dried up. You know, it's taken 100 years since 1820 on to this time. Very exciting times. And so the, the map then looks very different to what it did before. And it's been controlled largely by the British and, of course, the French up in Syria at that time. Jerusalem wasn't in the hands of the Jews, though, was it? It was in the hands of the British. Sure, they sympathised with the Jewish people, but it wasn't in the hands of the Jews. And another remarkable man that we know, and there's a lot written about him, was raised for a purpose. And this is one of his purposes, was to continue on and to make sure that that declaration came about. And there's a picture of him in Jerusalem and he's meeting uh, at a reception at the government house in Jerusalem there with um, Musa Qasim Pasha al Hassini. I think that's how you say it. Let's just call him Mr. Hassini. And Mr. Hassini at that time was desperately trying on behalf of the Arabs there, or the non-Jewish people, to, to ask uh, Mr. Churchill to please, let's just get rid of this Balfour thing. Let's just move it on. But Winston Churchill was sent there for a purpose, and that was to keep that alive. This was his response. We know that Winston Churchill had many great speeches. And sometimes he says a whole lot when he really could have just said no. And this is what he said. You have asked me in the first place to repudiate the Balfour Declaration and to veto immigration of the Jews into Palestine. It is not in my power to do so, nor if it were in my power would it be my wish. The British government have passed their word by the mouth of Mr Balfour that they will view with favour the establishment of a nation home for the Jews in Palestine, and that inevitably involves the immigration of Jews into the country. This declaration of Mr Balfour and of the British government has been ratified by the Allied powers who have been victorious in the Great War, and it was a declaration made while the war was still in progress, while victory and defeat hung in the balance. It must therefore be regarded as one of the facts definitely established by the triumphant conclusion of the Great War. It is upon this basis that the mandate has been undertaken by Great Britain. It is upon this basis that the mandate will be discharged. I have no doubt that it is on, on this basis that the mandate will be accepted by the Council of the League of Nations, which is to meet again shortly." And that was his answer. And I don't think Hassini said another word after that. But that's a long way to say no, isn't it? But this man was yet another man that I said back in, in Jeremiah there was fishes that would help to facilitate this process of bringing the Jews back to the land. Finally, on day 3, June 9, 9th, which is another commemorative of this year, 50, uh, um, 50 years ago, we have the war, the, th the Six Day War, and on day three of that war, we had more prophecy fulfilled in Luke 21, verse 24, with Jerusalem finally in the hands of the Jewish people. Jerusalem shall be trodden down, it says in Luke 21, of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, Brother Peter spoke of this this morning briefly in his exhort. It, aren't we living in remarkable times? That city, even though it was finally in the hands of the Jews, really, that city was not, it was not a peaceful place and it has not been a peaceful place. A cup of trembling, a burdensome stone it talks about in Zechariah 12. And so after many more wars, and, and some seven years after the Yom Kippur War, that Israel decides to make this statement 
or to make this as one of their laws, that Jerusalem will be the capital. That was in 1980. But immediately, the UN came up with a, with a further resolution, Resolution 478, also in 1980. This resolution says that it condemns Israel's 1980 Jerusalem law, which declared Jerusalem to be Israel's complete and united capital as the violation of international law. So the UN have made it quite clear to the world that Jerusalem cannot be called the capital of the Israeli people. Isn't that remarkable that they're still against that happening? They go on to say that this resolution also calls upon member states to withdraw their diplomatic missions from the city. Well, that's very interesting in light of what's happened this week, of course. And it's very interesting if you note down the bottom that that resolution was passed by 14 votes to none and the only country who abstained from voting was the United States of America. Well, it is still a cup of trembling, isn't it, and a burdensome stone. And these are some of the, the news feeds that are continuously coming our way. And they're coming faster and faster every single day. You can, see they are, you can see Israel is becoming more and more of a focus in the world today. Israel and Hezbollah playing Russian roulette in Syria. Look at these headlines, aren't they amazing? Israel and Saudi Arabia are getting close. They're trying to do it covertly so no one can see. But they're getting closer. I mean, that's important for us because of the alliance with Shiva and Dedan. It's very important. You know, there's the Washington Times talking about the next war against Israel. Look at that picture of that dog. I don't know if anyone's seen that before. The three-headed dog. I don't know if I'd want to go near it. But the three heads of Iran, Hezbollah and Hamas. And look what they're being controlled by. You might not be able to see that very well on the, on the screen. They're being controlled by a collar which is made out of the Russian flag. Can you believe that? What an amazing picture. Iran, with support for Hezbollah and Hamas, it says, it's building itself ready for another war. Well, of course, Trump, this week, he's, he's created a, a great atmosphere for my talk tonight, which is really awesome. Trump recognises Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Now, in light of what we've just spoken about, you can see why the world is in uproar. You can't do that. It's illegal. It's actually illegal. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, deeply concerned as the US and Jerusalem move. The US recognises, this is the Turkish president, the US uh, recognition of Jerusalem risks igniting fire in the region, warns Turkey. Oh, who cares what Turkey says, probably? But they're all saying it. Everyone has an opinion on this. The whole world. If, if nothing else, this is a way to polarise who's on whose side. And it is fast moving towards something that we so long for, isn't it? Look at these news feeds that have just come up in the last couple of days. Gaza, death toll rising, you know, US embassy violence is rising. And you've got skirmishes erupting in the West Bank and in Gaza Strip. This is all happening now as we speak, all because of this. And then you've got on the, on the, on the right hand side, you've got uh, Nikki Haley and she's the U.S. representative to the U.N. And she's copying it from all angles. You know, the United Nations, 14 of the 15 members of the United Nations Secretary Council on Friday condemned President Donald Trump's decision of the week to recognise Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, saying it was a violation of U.N. resolutions and international laws. Sometimes you do wonder whether people like Nikki and others in Donald Trump's cabinet are saying, what's going to happen today? You know? <laughs> what, what fires have we got to put out today? It's amazing to think, well, you know, you might think, why was Donald Trump, why is he even president? Isn't that remarkable, brothers and sisters, from knowing what we know? Isn't he a fantastic tool to use? <laughs> Isn't he amazing? Just got his little Twitter account and away he goes. It's beautiful. 
I'm sure the angels must be very happy to have a man like that that they can utilise to bring all this together. It's just a remarkable thing. Well, let's just finish off for the last little while with looking at some of the Bible quotes and saying, what does the Bible say? I mean, that's, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful thing. It's very encouraging. Here's some quotes that we'll just run through. For lo, the days come, this is in Jeremiah, says the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave them, their fathers, and they shall possess it. It's a, it's a promise. It's what God's promised. So it's no surprise to us, is it? It's just confirming what we've been told. For lo, in, again in, in chapter 30 of Jeremiah, I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet and none shall make him afraid. Well, certainly part of that has been fulfilled. But the remainder of that verse is yet to be fulfilled. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Pretty clear, isn't it? Not just bringing them out of Egypt, they're from everywhere. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of, Jeru of Judah from the four corners of the earth. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. Perhaps we're seeing that before our very eyes, brothers and sisters. Perhaps that verse fits in December 2017. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. As the morning spreads upon the mountains a great people and a strong there hath not been ever the like neither shall there be any more after it speaking about the invasion that will happen over that land. This is stuff that is still to happen, but we know it is very close, isn't it? And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? So even though this the world's attention will come upon Zion and there will be a great army to come across that land. At the end of the day, they've got to face up to God and his army. Who can abide it? Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, says the, your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord, Lord's hand double for all her sins. And that's the words, of course, that will be spoken of, um, by Isaiah. Sorry, by um, it, um, Elisha. Elijah. Sorry. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his own son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. That's Zechariah 12. Perhaps come over to Zechariah 12. There's so much written in Zechariah of this time. It goes on to say in verse 11, In that day there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, a great mourning, as the mourning of Hadad Rimmon in the valley of Megiddo, 
and the land shall mourn every family apart, the, fa the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, and the families of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. There will be a great amount of mourning. If you go into chapter 13, you will see in verse 8, verse 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, says the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall scatter, and will return, and will turn mine hand upon the little ones. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, says the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but a third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. And so the Jewish people will eventually go through this great, terrible time. It's coming. It's so close, isn't it? Two-thirds of them will be wiped out. But God will rescue a third and they will see Jesus and they will see his marks in his hands and in his feet and they will know. No longer will they be in unbelief of the Messiah who came to save them in the first place, but they will believe. Why do we get so excited whenever we see anything about Israel, about Jerusalem? because they are his witnesses. If you're teaching your children, teach them to watch out for Israel, to look out for the signs. There's no greater sign, brothers and sisters, than Israel, than the Jewish people in Israel. Why did God want them to be his witnesses? That ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. And of course we have in Luke 21 these words, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars upon the earth, distress of nations and perplexities, sea and waves roaring. We know all these words, don't we brothers and sisters? Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. We don't fear, do we? Because we know. For the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, brothers and sisters, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. And that's what we look forward to, isn't it? So let's lift up our heads and look up. Let's just realise that we really, truly are in the last days. And we need to be ready for that time when our Lord returns. Thank you.